Welcome, everybody. It's uh, Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. It's part of our uh, municipal election update. Election day is October 15th, and we are on the unceded territory of the Quaquitlam First Nations. And we wish to thank them uh, for allowing us to use this space to give you updates on what's happening municipally in our region. Uh, today, we have uh, Councillor Steve Darling. Welcome to the well, I would say show, but it's actually welcome to the, <laughs> welcome to the space. But uh, nice to see you. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank good, you. Good, very good, much. good, good. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, it's it's it kind of feels weird. It's like you're, I'm I'm interviewing you. Most people know you if you're at a certain age. We we know you for sure. But there's a lot of folks who are moving into our area. Yeah. And then now we're going into your second term. Can, can you give a sense of uh, who you are and and kind of yeah. uh, what you stand for? Well, uh, who I am right now is a, a dad and a husband. I mean, that's that's first, first and foremost, and uh, you know that's that's the most important thing to me. My wife Jen and my my kids Hunter and Haley, and um, they've got even busier lives than I have. I mean, I'm very busy, and they have very busy lives as well. And and our dog Red, which is uh, the newest member of our family over the last couple of years. So um, I was a news anchor for um, you know 30 years. I worked in radio first. Uh, Worked at CKW, CKWX, CHRX, uh, JR Country, where I was uh, Steve the Stunt Guy. Back in the day, I'd go around and, and, and help listeners win concert tickets and things like that by getting them to do crazy stunts and things like that. I, it was a great time because I was so young and it was so into, and, the, and radio at that time was phenomenal. I mean, it was just, it was really when it was happening. Artists were we're coming into town. We, I got to meet, you know, Garth Brooks and Shania Twain and, and Reba McIntyre and Alan Jackson, all these big stars. And But it was really, the radio game was great then. It was really all about personality, all about entertainment. We had, this city had some of the greats of all time. And so I was fortunate enough to, in my career, to be right in that sort of sweet spot of when it was really happening. And then, um, you know, after my radio days, I I say the greatest thing that ever happened to me was I met Squire Barnes, mm -hmm. and Squire was was really the one guy who believed that I could do television because look, I was I was heavy set, I, I didn't have any television experience whatsoever. I wasn't I'm not your stereotypical as we used to call them hair and teeth. That's mm -hmm. it wasn't me. Yeah. Um, but Squire's the same way, and that's what he said. Look, I know you can do the job, and I know you can broadcast. So. Why don't you come do sports at, B at Global, at BCTV at the time? And I was walked into the newsroom with, you know, the greats of Tony Parsons and Pamela Martin and Bill Good. And, and uh, it's just, you learn how to be good really quick <laughs> because yeah. when, you, when they're there and you're not good, you're out the door. That's the way that newsroom works. It's the best in the world. And so I got an opportunity to learn from some of the greats. And after three years of doing sports and weekends, I got an opportunity to start hosting the morning show. And, and, and that's what I did. And that really sort of put me on, on the path to... And I was there for 16 years until I was let go. And, and you know, it was, it was a big outpouring of support for me when I got let go from a lot of people. And people I wouldn't even expect would ever watch our show, like fairly significant names. And they, but the great thing about it was um, the fans spoke for me, which was great. And I never had to um, because I got let go and a lot of people get, low from, get let go from the jobs. Mine was just very more, much more public. Mm. And so I uh, rebounded from that. I ended up, um, I went to Sportsnet, worked there for a while and got a, uh, an opportunity to, to do my current day job, which is a company called Proactive. So we're a digital media company. We cover business news. So we're, we're sort of a Bloomberg for, for business news. And what we cover is sort of micro cap companies. So all I do is I do interviews with CEOs and presidents of companies. And I talk to people all over the world. It's fantastic. It's a great job. Um, they've been amazing to me. And it keeps me, keeps that broadcasting part that I love so much. And then with, combined with my city council duties, it's, I've got a very, very full and rich life right now. Yeah, well, I, again, uh, I know when you on council for the first time, you know, yeah. I, I know when you came in, it was like, uh, uh, I guess it, uh, your name was strong name recognition. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, your first time on council, you've got COVID. Yeah. You know, and, and so so not only do you have to learn the job, I mean, everybody has to learn that first. You got you know, right in the middle of it. You're, you've got a kind of a COVID adventure, yeah. as I'm calling it. How did, how did that feel? And and. And yeah, think city weather. I mean, I was, it, it's a bit different for me because I've covered municipal politics for a long time and yeah. I've covered a lot of elections. I've, I've covered politicians for a long time. So I felt fairly comfortable about doing the job. I'm also a journalist. So I, I, before I even, you know, had our first council meeting, I was reading 
past minutes of things that we were going to talk about. I'm, I'm, a, I'm that type of person who likes to do a lot of research on, on, on topics and find out, you know, why, why did council go this way in a certain time or why did they change things? And so I do a lot of research on that. So I've become, I, I, I want to say that I'm very well prepared to come into a, to those kind of meetings. But having said that, nobody's prepared for COVID because you're literally all of a sudden you're in your basement, <laughs> you're, exactly. you're on your, and, and I was lucky because, because my company has a broad, we're broadcasters. I built a professional studio in my, in my house. And so I was able to, um, sort of feel real comfortable in that particular role. Um, and sort of getting to see people, um, through zoom and trying to, you know, do the city business was hard, but it was actually a challenge and I love challenges and we were able to overcome. And I thought our city, specifically Port Coquitlam, and, and that's led by our mayor, um, Brad West, is that you have to, even though we're in these tough times, you have to get people through it. Mm. And we made decisions that I thought really had a huge impact on people's lives and had a huge impact on their ability to, to, to come through the pandemic. And we're not there yet. There's, there's obviously, we, we're going to another flu season soon. And, and I'm hoping that um, it's more the flu and not COVID that, that sort of is the, is the topic of the day. But, but it was a challenge and, and it was a challenge for staff too, because you know, they had to do everything virtually and they had to try and get things done. And you know, there was building inspectors and there was people that, you know, we had to sit in front of a Zoom camera and, and make decisions, but we're not firefighters on the front line. We're not the police on the front line. So while I would never complain about what happened for us, our experience through COVID, um, I just can't say how proud I am of the people in our city who stepped up and, and, and really helped people in the community. Yeah, it was sort of ironic. I know the Poco Heritage there did their four Fs, which is, you know, obviously yeah. talk about Poco history, and it launches just as we get COVID, which <laughs> yeah. I, is kind of irony and a good, yeah. it's a bad presentation, yeah. but a, a very poignant time, so. Well, and, the, and those are the kind of things that you, you look on and you go like, you know, we thought this was gonna be this, and then it turned into this, yeah. and that's what, I found during COVID and, and people would come to us and say, look, we're, you know, especially businesses, you know, I, the great example I always give is Patina. Mm. Uh, Patina just had opened up and, and all of a sudden they're shut down. Mm. And there's other businesses that are, that are in a similar boat to that. And so we were trying to find ways, how can we make it easier for people? And as the pandemic went on, we were sort of pivoting all the time, like, okay, now we can be on patios, but you gotta be this far away. So we tried to make it easy for businesses to be able to operate because all we wanted was people to get back to work because that was important, right? Because mm. people, have, you know, as much as there was money available, it wasn't a lot. So people really had to keep keep working. And especially, you know, through the gig economy, it's it's a challenge for, for young workers. So so we were trying to make it as easy as possible for people to do that. And and also make it easy on our staff as well, because, you know, there our building inspectors couldn't go out and go into places without having these strict protocols in place and things like that. So so I, I, I thought that that was a that was you could really see the community sort of come together. And I thought our community specifically and, and our mayor and council were very progressive in trying to be ahead of the curve and know what was coming next. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what what made our city be able to, to to handle the pandemic the way we did. Yeah, so a couple of things you did bring in, I mean, the drinking in the parks, you know, yeah. there's, there seemed to be a, that, that seemed to be, you know, nervousness by everybody in some ways. And then I know you're, so it's a sense of what that what brought that up and, and sort yeah. of obviously it was successful, but. Yeah, I, I don't think there was nervousness. Um, um, I think there, when we sort of brought it forward, there were only two, there was one concerning group and that was, the SD 43 because mm -hmm. they were concerned about specifically Gates Park because it's right beside Riverside. Um, but the idea of the, of the drinking in the parks was, and I'll never forget. It was a, it was a, actually Brad Mayor West mentioned it. He said, he goes, maybe it's time we start treating adults like adults mm -hmm. um, because people were doing it anyway. They were drinking in the parks. And, yeah. and the problem was people who were in their homes, especially in, in around that area, like Gates Park, they were sitting in condos and they couldn't, they couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't do anything. Yeah. They couldn't have birthday parties. They couldn't have celebrations. They couldn't do anything. So all we did was just make it easier for people to go into a, a place where they could sit with family, sit with friends, sit six feet apart, have a drink, talk to each other, and then go their separate ways. Mm -hmm. It was a huge program. It came super successful. And to this day, we have had zero complaints, not one. 
The RCMP has not had a complaint. We haven't had complaints. It's been a, a roaring success. And that's why we kept it going. That's why we agreed to, to keep it going, because it was just, it was something that, that needed to happen and because of the time, but it was, uh, it's been a huge success so far. And people, and I, look, my friends are all in that boat. I, I'm, I'm there watching, I'm in all the fields, I'm at all the arenas, I'm everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they just, I always get that great idea, Poco, and now other cities are following our lead. Yeah. So, so I know you're a Poco boy for, for a while there, but how does it feel uh, when you get, you know, next year's 100 year of May Day? Yeah. So how did it feel to be the, the up the front, as they say, with the councillors and the mayor on the? Yeah, uh, for your it was first good. Day? I mean, I've, it's funny. I've, you know, I've, I've had a, I've had a such a career where I've been able to do so many cool things. Like I've been, you know, I've played shinny with Wayne Gretzky, and I've done, you know, I've been to, you know, up in planes, and I've been on warships, and I've been to a lot of different places in my career. I've been really lucky that way, but. When you're doing it in front of people that have entrusted you to help run the city, it means something more. Mm. And I love those kind of things. I love the small town feel with big dreams and big ideals that Port Coquitlam has. And um, it was so much fun. It was, it, it's funny because it's, you know, being a broadcaster and being someone who covers the news and covers people, I'm always used to being in the back. So I originally, when I go to events, when I, my first term, when we could go, we, it was only a short time we were allowed to go to events. I would literally stand at the back of the room because that's where the journalists sit. If you go into a, a, any kind of news conference or any kind of event, the journalists are always at the back. That's where they are. So I, I naturally go to the back of the room. And then um, Pardeep, who was, who was in our communication department at the time, she's like, She's like, Councillor Darling, you have to come to the front. And I'm like, all right, I keep forgetting. <laughs> like, like, I'm up there, I'm not back here. So, so those were, that, that was kind of fun. But it's, it's been a, it's, the last four years have been a, a bit of a blur because of what was going on with COVID and how much stuff we've been able to get done. But it's truly some of the most rewarding work I've ever done. And I'll just bring up one other thing. And that is, you know, people ask me, how do you, you know what, like I was doing about 60 charity events a year when I was at Global. I did a lot of charity work and I still do about 30 or 40 a year. I'm asked all the time to do them and I love doing them. And I've got one coming up soon for the Michael Cuccioni Cancer Foundation and I'm doing another cancer fundraiser and I do BC Children's Hospital and I do autism and I, there's a lot of things that I've supported and have hosted over the years that I continue to do. And people say, you know, what, what, what's, great, what, what's great about being a city councilor is when I was doing the charity work before, you try to fill holes. So there's gaps in funding, there's gaps in things. So, you're, so in charity work, you try to fill all those holes and, and try to get people the, the, the help or, the, or what they need as a charity. But as a city councilor, you can actually stop the hole before it starts. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really love about this kind of work is being able to make change before those things need to happen. And the great example is rent evictions. I've covered rent evictions in my career through Burnaby, through New West, through Vancouver. People come in, these landlords, these you know, money grubby people who steal stuff and go in and kick people out. And they, so they tried to do that in Port Coquitlam. They tried to do that and literally in a week, one week, we had a bylaw that was challenged and, and ended up winning. And those people stayed in their homes and never had to get kicked out, including uh, we got a beautiful letter from a woman whose father was a, was a veteran, was dying of cancer, and all he wanted to do was live in his home and, and die in his home. And they sent him a letter saying, you have to move out. And through our rent eviction bylaw, he stayed in his home and he died in his home. Mm. And his daughter sent his letter and said, she'll never forget that. Mm. That's what city council can do. Mm. Well, that's, that, that's a really uh, good story uh, in the sense of, you know, the connection. And, and I was going to say on the happy stuff. So yeah. before we get into the... Sorry. But that's okay. <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's a happy, good story. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but affordability. I know, I know you, you yeah. know, that's, that's big. What does affordability mean to you? And yeah. as a counselor, what, what do you think uh, you are doing or can do to kind of address that? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge because there's a lot of different layers to affordability and, and a lot of it is out of our control, unfortunately. But what we can do is provide the right type of housing. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, we had a housing needs assessment and, and it clearly showed that us in our city and many other cities are behind. We've approved 500 homes, affordability homes in, in our city. In a city or size, that's pretty good. We just, we just had 300 coming in last night at a new development that we have. So to me, it's, it's, it's giving people the opportunity to buy things. People can't afford, who are young, 
a $1.6, $1.72 million home anymore. They just can't do it. Yeah. But those people can start at a condo. They can start at a... But, but we don't want people in one bedroom and a den with three family members. So we brought in another part of our a bylaw through, through our development that allows people, um, developers specifically, to put family-friendly units in there, which means two, three, or four bedrooms. Because that allows families the opportunity to, there's nothing worse than, than getting into a place and you're, you know, bunk beds because you got three kids in one room and that's it. So we want it family friendly. That's important to us. We also want carriage homes. I think carriage homes are important in certain parts of the city because that gives people an opportunity to allow their kids to have some space or their kids can move into the home, which we're hearing, and then the parents live in the carriage house. So mm. they build a carriage house for them, and they, it works both ways. Because mm. people are living at home longer. I was just talking to a guy outside here today, and he's got, he's got a couple of kids, and they're both back at home now. Mm. And so life changes, things change. Uh, townhouses are a great option. They're, they're less expensive than at home. The upkeep is different. So I think it's providing a lot of different styles of housing for where you are in your life so you can build equity and then move into what you want to move into. But the day of, of you know, buying a home and living in it for 50 years is just, it, it, it doesn't happen as much anymore, if ever. So to me, affordability means to find the right type of homes and being having people the ability to live here and work here as well. So they're not spending hours in a commute or, or money on, on commuting, things like that. So that's what we're trying to do is, is build that to make sure that we have the right type of home and people can stay in Port Coquitlam. Yeah, and, and so, how, you know, you uh, for me, you know, I live in Port Coquitlam. So mm -hmm. to me, we, you know, my concern is that we're kind of the, the community is, is, you know, that legacy family, you know, you sort of have multi-generational, yeah. you know, Poco names and stuff, right? Yeah. But new people coming in is always going to be refreshing and great. But it feels like we're that's being challenged. It's, I, mean, I, I seem to know a lot of people who are moving the interior or they're, they're going yeah. to the island. So what is, what is your... That sense, because you're a sports guy, where you kind of have this strong community. It's yeah. a legacy. You know, you're you're being coached by yeah. the the guy that used yeah. to play type of thing. So, what what do you feel is that we have to protect in Port Coquitlam around that kind of community aspect? Yeah, I think community is is a lot of different things, and I think um, what you're talking about is people that have been in Port Coquitlam a very long time. Yeah, and they've earned the right to go where they want. Mm. If if they want to sell their home and move to um, Fanny Bay, and I know people that live in Fanny Bay. Or Souk. Yeah, or Souk, whatever it is, yeah. Then, then they're perfectly able to do that. But I think that when you are welcoming to everybody, they create community again. And community keeps building itself over and over and over again. And while, you know, the people you're talking about had great legacy within the community, they also probably have children or have family members or friends of family members that they know that start developing that community again. Community never dies. What community does is, is it adapts and it changes. And, you know, I'm trying to teach my kids, you know, what it means to be, like I, I wave to people a lot. It's just something I do, I'm just that kind of guy, right? And so my son said to me the other day, he goes, why are you, why do you wave to people? I said, because it's a part of community. Like, I, I, I don't know that person, but they live in our community. And I said, I want you guys to understand that, that you don't have to live in a house and not know anybody. Like, you want, you said, you go to your friends, you go to the parks and all that kind of stuff. But I said, just, just by a friendly wave, you probably made that person's day without even knowing anything about them. Mm -hmm. And they walk through the street and think, you know what? Someone did something nice for me today and I, I, I felt good about it. That's to me is how you create community. And I think community will continue to grow and grow and grow because people will leave, though, people will come. But as long as, the, as long as the heart of the city is still the same and still the values are there, that's where community develops from. So I know last election when you were running you know, in the debates that we covered, yeah. this kind of safe streets was coming up as a common thing. And, yeah. uh, and I know you've, you know, since then I've seen sort of... Uh, a whole bunch of stuff happened in the city of, of yeah. Port Quitlam. Just cover some of those points. That'd be great. Yeah, we, um, you know, I'm, I'm, public safety is one of my portfolios, and and you know, my kids are in, both in school in Port Coquitlam, so I'm very cognizant of of speeding. It's it's a it's a problem in our community. It's a problem in every community. And the funny thing is, most of the people who are speeding are your neighbors. Yeah. You know, they're the ones yeah. trying to get through. Or things. the guys annoyed. Don't yeah, speed. exactly, you know, exactly. Let's, let's so so them. we've tried to put in things that that. You know, there are certain routes that we're not allowed to just because 
you know, their, their arterial routes, they're for safety, things like that. Coast Meridian is a great example. Um, so we try to do things that, that, you know, speed reader boards, things like that. But Coast Meridian always continues to be a problem. And, you know, we've really pushed the RCMP to continue their enforcement because, you know, you, when you get a, a ticket, you, you tend to change your mind pretty quick. So yeah. you, you at least you'd hope so. Um, we've also put in 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 humps at school districts. We've we've put in curb bulges. We've tried to, um, you know, Prairie Avenue has been a been a, an interesting one over the last couple yeah. of years and roundabouts and things like. But what it does is it's slowing people down. Mm -hmm. And I know Prairie was a was a challenge when it was going through, and we had some challenges with that. But I think in the end, the road's safer. I think people are slower on that road because people were gunning it. They were going through it fast, yeah. and I think that. It's important to continue the work. There's more to come. Cedar was another great one because what's happening is there's so much development on Burke Mountain that people are ripping off Burke Mountain and they're ripping down Cedar to try and get to the highway. So we put in, we put in, we were going to put in just a light, and that was it. And I said, that I'm not, I'm not voting for that. I said we have to put something in there that slows people down, and that was why specifically we put in humps. We put in in humps. And people come around the corner, and and can we? Add, we don't want to add 50 humps, obviously, because it, it, for people that live there. But there are, I think, there's three on there right now. At least it it gives that that place where people slow down a little bit, because, um, you know, we know the alternative of what happens if people don't slow down. But yeah. but in the end, it's nine times out of ten, it's your neighbor, and and you're you know they're late for work or late for school or or something like that. And sometimes, and I'm I'm just you speed, I speed, we all speed, right? Yeah. But it's you know, I'm, I find myself having listened to the statistics and things like that. I, I try to slow down more. Um, I still speed like everybody else, but um, in in those areas, we're just trying to control it. And and it's a it's an ongoing battle. And we talk about it to the RCMP all the time. And they're aware of it. And they can't be there 24/7. But you know, we try to do the best we can, and that's by putting in these these small measures that we're able to do. Yeah, I think it's just kind of funny when you live in the city. When I saw saw the first bump, or I hit the first bump, yeah, I, I wasn't. I realized, wow, wow, I'm going faster than I should be. Yes, and I was annoyed. Yes, Prairie was annoying. But now it's finished. It seems uh, those kind of refuges where you know, pedestrians can feel they've got some kind of sense of I'm here, I guess. And, yeah. and then you've put up some lights as well, I think, in, in some yeah. areas. So yeah, um, the, the big change I think is a couple of ones is that, that I guess Prairie is looks like it's becoming more. Uh, bike lane or something's happening with that. Is that? Is yeah, that, it's, it's it. becoming more sort more sort of user friendly. So so there's an option for people to you you know you know drive or walk or, or yeah. cycle. And the other thing is we're getting a lot of these scooters now, motorized scooters and e bikes and things like that. So it's a, it's a real challenge to to try and develop. That's why we're you know on Burns Road. It was that was dangerous with people walking down the sides there. That's why we have built that multi-use path so people can at least have an opportunity to. To, to, to go down there and be safe. And so we're trying to put in, our, our staff is very good at understanding what safety is all about. And that's why we're trying to make it, is, is any road perfect? No, nothing is good, but it's intended to do certain things. And I think Prairie is one of those that, that has, um, has had some challenges with speed and with people being a bit reckless on it. But I, you know, I don't drive it every day, but I, I drive it enough to know that, that I think it's better um, I think it's people are slower on there, and I think it's a it's a it, it's an improvement from what we had before. Yeah. The roundabout has been a challenge because people don't understand no, how roundabouts work and things like that, and I get it. Yeah. Um, but roundabouts slow people down; they really do. And and it, I, I think in the end, that was the the main goal of that. Yeah. No, I think you just need a, an English person explaining what it, yeah, how it works. That's right. Um, that's right. So obviously, your you know one of your, your platforms is childcare. You know, you're, uh, you know, yeah. from a family perspective, just. Just in the region, what that, what does that mean to you, and, and what do you care so much? about? We're in a crisis. We really are. I mean, people cannot find daycare. Um, we're doing better. Um, you know, the Port Coquitlam Community Center opened up. There's a daycare in there, which has been great. But I I sat on the um, child care task force, and I, when I joined that task force, I remember I was sitting with Mayor West, and he said to me, he "Goes look." you gotta to go to this task force and get things done. We can't just have another task force that says, here's our recommendations, and they sit on, a, on the back of, of someone's chair and, and never, nothing ever happens. So when I went to the meeting, the very first meeting, um, and Trustee Blatherwick was there with me, and we were co-chairs of it, and I said to her, I go, I said, we gotta, we got, this has to work. We really need the help, and she's like, I agree. So the first thing in the meeting we said was, I don't wanna be a part of this committee if these recommendations are not gonna be used. 
And everyone in the committee was kind of like, and then they said, yeah, you're right, we need to do this. So when we finished our work, we put out a report. Of that report, almost every single one of those recommendations has now been picked up by the province and is used in, in their childcare legislation that they released. So it had an effect and which is important. But it also is a challenge to try and get people because there's a lot of people that used to do childcare and because of regulations and because of the way it worked, they don't do it anymore. And it's being replaced by, you know, sort of for profit companies that are doing it. So it's continuing to be a challenge. We're trying to make it easier on development developers to say, look, if you're gonna do a development like we approved last night with all this affordable housing is great, you gotta have childcare. It's super important. And so this one includes childcare. Um, you know, we've got a, another development on the Westwood area that's, 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 that went through last night as well. And I, I hammered them over and over and over again. Childcare, we need it, we need it, we need it. So we're working on, on getting childcare there and we've got a, a, an avenue to try and get to there. I, I think every developer or everyone who's developing in, in this city, uh, Port Coquitlam, needs to understand that if you're gonna have multiple families living there, they have to have a place to have their kids because there's, they're, we're running short of them. We're behind, we're yeah. way behind. And it's all ages, it's zero to three, it's fives, it's after school, it's before school. Yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty behind, but, um, and that's not us as in Port Coquitlam, that's the province. So we need to do more for childcare and give people options so they have a place to put their kids when they have to go to work. So we're down to you know four minutes. Sometimes time flies when you're yeah. talking about good stuff. So I just want to hit on some of the things that I know are near and dear to you. One is, uh, uh, you know, we were at the Giants game. Yes. And it was fun. They came to Great. play the new P Triple C, and then yeah. and you had a part to play in that. So I just thought you'd let pe let people know that yeah. uh, what you did there. Well, I I just you know I was at a I was at a charity golf tournament actually, and I was talking to the Giants, and I said, look, why don't you guys come to Poco? And they're like, well, no one's ever asked us. I said, well, I'm officially inviting you. Why don't you come play? So I get it. I said, well, he goes, well, let's talk about it. We'll call you back. Next day, I get a call. Hey, you want to do a three-game exhibition series? I'm like, great. I said, let me, uh, let me just, now that I've invited you, let me sort of figure this out. So um, it ended up being, they were going to do three games. And because they forgotten they had a, um, a barbecue on Sunday back in Langley with all their season ticket holders, they thought we'd better be there. Yeah. So, so it ended up being Friday night and Saturday night. Uh, sold out. Was good. Sold out. Yeah. Um, it oh. was massive. Um, it, uh, we talked about it a bit last night, and, and I was on the red carpet, you know, as part of the puck drop with the mayor and Councilor McCurr was there, and, and you could literally see just this building full, mm -hmm. and it was awesome. It really was. And I, I wanted to be really special. So I sort of tried to choreograph the opening. I wanted the Poco Pirates to be there. I wanted the, the uh, Tri-City Predators to be there. I wanted kids on there. I wanted a, an honor guard. I, I wanted, and then the queen passes away. Mm. And now the honor guard becomes a little bit more um, poetic, mm. if you put it that way. So it was really a magical night. It really was great. And I can't thank the Giants enough. And I think this is going to be an annual event. And we're yeah. working on some really cool stuff next time around. If I'm lucky enough to be a, a counselor and part of it, and if I'm honored to, to, to get people's votes, then, then I'll be you know, providing more of this kind of stuff in the future. I think it was great. The community loved it. Yeah, well, they sold three tickets or two, at least three tickets to future Giant games. My yes. wife loved it. So Absolutely. Uh, so just other things that are happening. Downtown, a huge change. You got like McAllister. Yeah. Uh, we got all. We got yeah. Lee party. Square is the next one, uh, yeah. um, which is important. Uh, that's going to be the next uh, next area that's going to be start start to to change, and it's going to be more family friendly. It's going to be uh, better lighting. It's uh, the the cenotaph is going to be improved. It's um, the, the, the 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 legion is behind this 100. percent They they're super excited about what we're going to do, and when people see it, they're going to be blown away for what mm -hmm. we have. Um, especially th that part of it is is going to be incredible. And then Lee Square is going to be amazing when people see what's what's coming. There's so many great things coming. Um, you know, that's a big one. Gates Park's redesign. We just opened up the Poco Saints um, home field now, uh, which is unbelievable. And BC Soccer will be here by next September yeah. with a whole new facility. The, 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 nothing irritates me more than going to Gates Park at 8 o'clock at night and seeing the back of it black with mm. nothing there. Mm. It's pitch black. There's nobody there. It's, you can't walk. It's, it's just no, no, no energy. After this happens, wait till you see Gates Park in a year. 
you will go there and you'll be blown away by what we're going to do. This city is on, this city is, is moving forward like you can't believe. And, and it, it comes from the top. And Mayor West is a huge supporter of, of all these kind of things that we're doing. And our council has been on, on par with it moving forward. And we've been able to do more in four years during a pandemic than I think we, that, that a council has ever done before. We've got so much stuff coming and there's so much more to come. Well, I want to thank you for coming in. Yeah, yeah. like I said, that was that uh, it. Holy, wait, thirty minutes. You know, you're, Sorry, I tend to talk I got, a I got the bit. team going. No, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we should we should chat more often, as they yeah. say. So, well, um, I just want to say one real thing, real quick. Thank you, um, oh, thank you. for the work that you do. I, this is I started in in community television. Yeah. People may not know that I started Delta Cable. I did a show called uh, called um, I, I get to interview Mr. Buzzer from BC Transit. It yeah. was the it was called Neighborhood Friends. So this is where this community television is important. So yeah. thank you. Well, I, I have a connection to the fire log that we have every Christmas. So. <laughs> but, but thanks for coming in. Okay. Uh, that's Councilor Steve Darling. He's running for re-election for the second time in the city of Port Coquitlam. If you want to know more about Steve Darling, or uh, please check out his social media site, and, uh, and the, or just see him in the street and walk up and say hi. He's a pretty friendly guy. So again, this is Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. Thanks for watching.